Dear students, welcome to today's events on our third day of the EU week with our honored guest, President Romano Prodi. Romano Prodi was uh, served twice as Italia's prime minister and was former president of the EU Commission. And today we have the honor to talk with you about the future of Europe and how to rebuild the economy post COVID. I'm honored uh, to have you. Thank you very much for joining. Before, we hand, <laughs> before we hand the microphone to you, I would like to give the chance to, to Professor Friedel to have some opening remarks. Professor Friedel is the Dean of Tom School of Management. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Clara. And uh, also very warm welcome from my side to this uh, highlight session of our European Union week. It's uh, really a pleasure that uh, uh, we are, we, we, we have the honor to uh, welcome President Romano Prodi, the former president of the European uh, Commission for our um, event here that is jointly organized between the Technical University of Munich and RCC Paris. And in fact, it is organized by the students. So the Tom Speaker Series and, uh, and RCC Debat um, are the two organizations that have organized our European Union Week. Um, I personally could not imagine a better person than President Prodi to speak about the future of the European economy after COVID-19. Um, we have faced in Europe and we are still facing a dramatic situation. Uh, you all know that um, uh, COVID has caused about 6% of the European population uh, to, 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 um, been, uh, to have been tested positive. About 1 million person died for COVID-19. Um, our gross domestic product in the European Union in 2020 went down by about 5%. Um, and uh, the you, uh, you, uh, the European Union has decided on an unprecedented recovery plan worth 750 billion euro as a temporary instrument to basically uh, come out of this crisis situation. In this, uh, in this scenery, we are happy to uh, well, to discuss these topics with President Romano Prodi, and President Prodi is, uh, uh, I think, the best person uh, to discuss this topic because of his uh, broad um, experience in academia, politics, and the economy. And uh, I want to just briefly give you a short, um, uh, a, a short, a short impression about his uh, car uh, his career in order to let you know um, how um, how well he is prepared for talking about these uh, topics. So he 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 actually studied uh, law and economics at Catholic University in Milan. Um, he was at the universities in Milan, Bologna, London School of Economics, visiting a professor at Harvard and Stanford Research Institute. He, had, he, he started an academic career as an assistant associate and full professor uh, at the University of Bologna, some say the oldest uh, university of at least the Western world. Um, and uh, after uh, this academic career, he joined uh, politics. He joined politics um, in 1978 as a an, uh, minister of industry. Um, he was the chairman of the large Istituto per la Ricostruzione Industriale, the largest holding company in Italy. Um, and uh, under, this, uh, under the leadership of President Prodi, um, this large publicly owned industrial tanker that has been heavily criticized for a long time for its inefficient and politically undermined structures was completely reorganized and started a successful process of privatization in Italy. Um, he founded the Ulivo coalition, leading him to become Italian prime minister in 1996. And most notably during his office, um, the, the Italy underwent a substantial process of fiscal consolidation. Uh, Italy was allowed to be a founding member of the newly created Eurozone, and uh, this rapid and positive transformation of Italy 
turned him, Romano Prodi, ultimately in a the highly esteemed political at the European level. And as a consequence, he was appointed as commission president from 1999 to 2004, actually the first president of the European Commission. Under his leadership, the uh, expansion process in Europe uh, with 10 central and eastern European countries was started and finalized. Um, this is not only an impressive technical achievement, uh, the extension of the European Union shows the economic and also the geopolitical foresightedness of President Prodi. Um, he recognized that the EU enlargement will play an important role in meeting with the economic, environmental and social challenges laying ahead. And in fact, from an economic perspective, at least some European countries, we in Germany, I think in particular, uh, clearly benefited from this enlargement. And this raises the more fundamental point that can be found in the scholarly and polit political work of Professor Prodi. In 2002, when the commission under his leadership issued a new communication on industrial policy, it was emphasized that for tackling the economic and the political challenges, such as climate change also today, the European Union has to build on knowledge, on innovation and on entrepreneurship. And uh, President Prodi recognized that it is especially the entrepreneurship part that is the weak point of the European Union and that has to be strengthened. And uh, we benefit a lot from this uh, recognition. Even today, the European Research Council, for example, came up in 2007, only two years after the uh, end of the presidency of uh, President Prodi. So you see that here is a truly political head of Europe, and we are really glad, President Prodi, to have you here on behalf of the organizers, the Technical University of Munich and RGC Paris. We are honored to have you here for your speech. Thank you. No, I am happy to be with you, and uh, uh, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have, on your mandate, I have 20 minutes to talk about uh, the post-COVID European economy in the framework of uh, global economy. Uh, few points. First of all, uh, as you hinted in the past, uh, we had a deep crisis, but different in the three years areas of the world. And even more different is now the speed of recovery. The speed of recovery uh, is uh, very, very fast in uh, China. Uh, I, you can also not call it a recovery because China didn't have any minus in the economy even last year. Chinese growth of all was 0.2, while European was minus five and US even more. And so uh, now in the recovery, uh, uh, we have uh, different forecasts. Let's say China, let us forget it because uh, in the first uh, quarter, the growth was plus 18, but you know, this is a temporary, but we have a, a growth that it will be substantial, more than the uh, average growth uh, in the last two Chinese uh, years before the pandemic. But what is surprising is United States. Uh, United States growth will be absolutely uh, beyond any previous uh, uh, forecast. The reason is very simple, uh, the new US policy. Um, an incredible revolution. Uh, let's say, I don't make the addition of the different decision of, you, of US government, but uh, now there are, let us say around plus uh, $4 trillion injected in the American economy uh, with a total revolution uh, concerning uh, the previous uh, strategy, let's say more 
on subsidies more than any more uh, a real revolution on public works that will be uh, out of any uh, strategy for so many decades uh, and traditional injection in technology and uh, in uh, the other fields of the economy. Uh, so Europe, uh, we grow less. Uh, uh, we hope uh, uh, sound healthy growth of 4% this year, at least I think, maybe a little more, uh, but uh, clearly less than the US and the uh, US uh, and uh, China. But uh, uh, this is basic field. But what is important to, 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 to analyze now uh, with a totally different uh, trend of competition? This is the real question mark. Uh, we uh, developed it in the last 30 years with an increasing globalization uh, that was, in my opinion, very positive for uh, global growth, but with some, let's say, mistakes or weakness that politically has been very important in the history of the last uh, at least two decades. Let's say uh, uh, the moving of the industry or economics from, let's say, middle west of US or some Italian uh, areas and so on, uh, or European, to China, and they had uh, increased some sort of uh, progressive resentment and with an increase of employ unemployment, uh, with uh, uh, some political, I repeat uh, the word resentment and uh, un uneasiness, and so uh, uh, this has changed the political agenda of uh, the entire world. Uh, of course, the Malay started with the uh, Donald Trump decision, uh, especially in some fields uh, of the uh, market area economy, uh, but uh, is a Malay that is still uh, very sensible among uh, inside the electorate of both US and uh, and Europe so the result will be a correction of the global competition correction does not mean uh, the end of uh, the globalization this means some sort of break and some sort of change but basically uh, we, sh we shall, in my opinion, we shall have uh, at least uh, open market in the world, uh, some sort of, uh, uh, I don't see a total change as some, uh, as quite a few economists uh, for Z, for a simple reason that the links of the economies has gone too far. One, only one figure, when more than one third of Chinese export are produced by non-Chinese multinational companies, you have a link, you have a link. And this also has been the reason why the tensions uh, uh, among uh, US and between US and China are not anymore uh, economic. Well, they are economic, but in a different way, uh, more technology, more uh, all the sectors linked link to politics, uh, information, so on, and a little less to the traditional goods, you know, for the reason that uh, in some way a compromise at least is, uh, is, going, is going on. But, but with a, a substantial change in the field of what I call economic autonomy, the mask effect is a teaching that will go on at least for one generation. Mask effect uh, means that uh, when uh, COVID came, 
only Chinese were producing masks. That is the simplest product that you can have in your mind. But we didn't use it. We didn't produce it. And so you had an unbalance for a lot of months in favor of China. This uh, is becoming a general feature. Now, I cannot talk about, uh, about the mask effect only because concerning chips, uh, technological projects, and so on and so on. And so on. But uh, the value uh, each of the three main areas, Europe, US, and China, will oblige it to be in control of some strategic uh, uh, part of the chain, main chain values. Not look, not 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 a big part, but at least uh, uh, to save some sort of autonomy in case, in case. And this is a political push that is going on. Very interesting because this is the origin of reshoring. Reshoring will not be so uh, dominant as somebody thinks. But there will be reassuring sufficient to uh, provide in case of unforeseen events in order to avoid the mask effect. This is an important, uh, there is no time to, to deal with this issue, but Europe is not organizing uh, uh, the, the, the reassuring because reassuring will not be, this small reassuring will not be homogeneous among European countries. Of course, the shoring in textile will be low cost and so on and so on. And, so on. and, and uh, this will be a problem of absolutely unknown, not debated, but will be a great problem concerning the future of the European, the future of European economy. But in this picture, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a strange situation that um, Europe big fighting China U.S. for supremacy. Europe traditionally linked, and I completely agree, uh, linked with the U.S. Atlantic, you know, security, defense, but from the economic point of view. Nobody under, uh, under, um, underscores that uh, this year is the first year in history in which Europe is trading more with China than with the United States. An incredible change. So this means that our friendship is friendship, but uh, must be performed, must be organized, keeping account of the different interests. And this problem is concerning all the European countries, but even more Germany, you know, uh, that uh, uh, huge investments in China, uh, big star, the only country uh, with Holland, but, uh, you know, very exceptional surplus with China. Uh, uh, and and uh, why Mrs. Merkel, that is absolutely Atlantic, she signed uh, the, the investment agreement between the passage between Biden, uh, between Trump and Biden, my interpretation is very simple, intelligent uh, move in order uh, when we have to deal in the future, Europe is in a stronger position, you know, um, also because this deal is only a project uh, might be approved by the parliament. It's difficult that it will be approved, but it is in some way a message that say, look, we are friends, but 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 we are nice people. <laughs> That's what it is this way, you know. And so now uh, this new round will uh, will uh, start. Uh, in this very complicated political and economic picture, you know, in which the European interest is uh, to have a clear uh, political position in all the fields in which 
in which uh, the political future is at stake, but uh, must uh, uh, show that uh, Europe has some, uh, some deep interest uh, for the future uh, development. Clearly, but this future is complicated by uh, the different speed of the decision-making process in the three areas. Absolutely uh, blitz uh, in China, very uh, quick in the United States, very slow at European level. It was, look, if you think to, 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 to uh, the Vassil speed, Europe was not bad, you know, you Germans and you uh, have, have given a substantial part of the brain of the new vaccine, uh, but but why uh, this was American made, you know, because uh, President Trump, he put money on the table in one minute. And uh, this, is, this is difficult for the European decision-making process. And now with the picture of the future policy, I, I, I did in the few minutes that I was speaking, you have a clear idea, idea that speed is vital. And so uh, the future of Europe, of Europe will depend on uh, this. And this is a difficult, you know, uh, the European Council that in the last years, has taken much more power than the Commission, you know, after the after the, the veto of uh, the French people to the European Constitution, you had a shift of power from uh, the Commission to the, the Commission that is the supranational body to the Council that, by definition, represent the different countries, in which you have. Uh, uh, the veto effect, uh, the possibility of veto. And you know that uh, when you have the unanimity, even a dwarf is a giant. Because the joy of a prime minister of a country of less than half a million people going home that blocked all the decision of uh, 50 million, of 500 million people, that is a fantastic job, you know, from a political point of view, even if you have internal elections, you know. So we are, we are in the very difficult dilemma. If I tell the future of Europe is linked to one word, unanimity because uh, politics is decision. If, you have that, if we have that, we are still for a few months, but still number one in industrial production in the world and uh, number one in export, you know. Now Ch China is overcoming us, but, but we represent a lot and politically we are nothing. Politically we have uh, uh, close to the, to Europe, you know, 200 kilometers from Sicily, you have Russia and, and Turkey dominating in Libya. That is absolutely out of any, of any imagination, you know. But the same will happen in post-COVID economics. If we don't find a way of deciding soon the decision of the Commission, of the Council, of everybody, of a King of Europe, but if we don't find this, we are out of any future evolution. Think, think to one economic problem, you know, the taxation of the big uh, uh, internet uh, linked companies, you know, uh, many proposals of Europe, but uh, Ireland was against, of course, uh, and OECD and President Biden proposed uh, to have this taxation that is absolutely in the total interest of Euro, because uh, he understood, Biden understood to have one problem, you know, the, uh, the increase of, of difference. Uh, because of that, he entered and said, look, let us put a taxation more than 21% and a different we European that we are much more interested to that we didn't do it. 
So look, the future, as you asked me to talk about the European economy post COVID, we potentially, we have everything, but we have to change our decision making process. In one moment, we did it. I am sorry. No, I have still three minutes. <laughs> uh, look, uh, uh, Europe has done in the last year a lot of pro uh, progress, you know, because the next generation EU uh, has not been an easy decision with uh, different interests of the European country. It was possible, a possible mediation. I tell you, don't, don't misunderstand me, was possible only because of Brexit, eh? because uh, UK should have never accepted this mediation and the British strength was uh, enough to block it. But, you know, uh, uh, after, because of a bad event, we had also uh, some good, good, good consequence, you know. So we had this, and this is a, a decision that was not liked by all the uh, European countries, a lot of perplexity even in Germany, but with a shared vision that for the future was indispensable. But this uh, puts a question mark that uh, is increasing that, uh, uh, a lot of that in Europe. Uh, Last observation, this is a common feature of the world. I told you before of the new uh, American strategy, uh, the result is an, in, an enormous increase in debt everywhere. Uh, in my experience, uh, when there is this phenomenon, uh, there is inflation. But I know that everybody is against my point of view, so I am wrong, and people of central banks and IMF are right. But I am maybe an old industrial economist looking at, uh, let's say, concrete things. But uh, you have a lot of money everywhere. You have. A, a, a higher increase, higher growth in China and the US, scarcity in very many fields from high tech products, uh, products uh, to steel or, or, or copper, or copper, uh, or even in Italy, you have scarcity of containers. That is absolutely absurd. And when you have this combination, uh, you have to be very careful. But I repeat, uh, this is only a last observation, just in order to invite students, everybody of us, to keep attention to that, because I still hope to be wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Polly. That was really interesting and such an inspiring keynote. There are so many points I would like to touch upon and discuss. Uh, but before we do so, I would like to encourage our audience to think about questions and ask them in the chat on the right side of the screen, which you can see. And um, if you like some question, please upvote them so that we know which um, questions are of your interest. And then we'll ask them later in the Q&A session. Do I answer question by question or you regroup, which is the, the custom of, the, of your tribe? So first of all, I will ask you some questions, which I prepared, okay. which are of great okay. interest. And then you can answer oh. them one by one. We will have just discuss it. Thank you. Cool. So um, before we dive into the topic, how to rebuild our economy, I would uh, like to consider first why we're still in the economic situation as we are and why the build up hasn't already begun. And this is mainly due to the fact that we are lacking behind in vaccinations and that the EU hasn't been able to uh, purchase vaccines fast enough. 
and even though um, a major innovation hub was inside Europe, with um, namely with BioNTech and Pfizer, um, we are lacking behind and our supplies are much slimmer than those of Israel, Great Britain or even the United States. So my question to you, Mr. Prodi, could you sum up again, what, are the, what were the mistakes that the EU, EU did and um, what, is the, what are the reasons for the past and the still ongoing shortage in vaccine supply? Look, uh, my opinion, of course, uh, I am an economist, you know, so I stress more the economic, you know. Uh, if we, what I had in mind when, to vaccine when they started, well, I thought, look, Europeans are ahead of that, Europeans in America. Traditionally, the vaccine is uh, Paris, you know, Pasteur, uh, Sanofi. So we shall do it. But what happened? That is part of capitalism and so on, so on, so on. National interest has pushed the Trump to put money on the table immediately. And so the Americans have started the research. They went to Germany. To, 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 let's say, to um, put together resources, you know, intellectual, economic resources. And so the speed was higher and uh, they gained momentum. Uh, this is my simple explanation. And this is also why, even if uh, technology was not so, uh, let's say, so advanced in Russia, the Russians were uh, speedy, uh, were quick enough to to to, to produce uh, the, the 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 Sputnik Five uh, because they decided immediately, and we European because you need a lot of money, you know, uh, a single company doesn't take even if big such an enormous risk immediately, but with the government aid there was a policy and there was not a Euro the European policy came later with the distribution of vaccine. This was very positive, avoided the horrible competition among European countries, but uh, not in the case of production. True, yeah. And, and would you say that there is a relation, a uh, coalition bet between the example of slow vaccine procurement and the structural problem of the decision making within the EU? Because as you were saying, we did it all together, but um, for the, 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 uh, well, the other side, the downside was that we are much slower than single countries. So is there a structural problem that we could do better in? My answer is simply yes. Right. There is a problem. <laughs> Clara, there is a problem. <laughs> and uh, difficult to solve. I, the conference about the future of Europe opened yesterday. The aim is let us solve this problem. But uh, 12 European countries told, no, we cannot change the the, the uh, let's say all the agreement, uh, the the tract, uh, tractate, uh, you know, the, the, the. if we don't do it, we shall be late. Happy, but late. Yeah, true. So do you have concrete ideas um, how the EU could become more agile and more efficient um, while still having everyone involved and every member state involved? <sighs> I don't want to be very pessimist or too blunt, but we made a great step ahead, great step ahead only during crisis. In this crisis, we did the next Europe EU, uh, and uh, I hope that we are wise enough to do it before a crisis. Because, you know, when there is an anti-European mood uh, in many cases. But when you arrive to say yes or no, people understand that Europe is Europe. In the last election, European election, every forecast was, look, uh, uh, the non-European uh, parties uh, will gain. They, they lost. Simply, when you arrive to yes or no, you say Europe is Europe. 
This is true, yeah. I, I really hope that is the case. But m m one might think that by now, after the crisis, this has changed because there were so many subsistences of large parts of the population that were eroded by the wake of lockdowns and social distancing measures. So I think many uh, European citizens now point their anger towards uh, the EU and their frustration, be it because of the vaccine um, campaign or because of the lack of cooperation between member states that we saw in the first lockdown, especially. So what would you say, um, how can the EU reestablish trust from, um, of the European citizens inside the, in the EU and its institutions? Look, uh, when I, I received this question from my students, my answer is Europe is our bread, but it's only half cooked. And the half cooked bread is horrible. Do you want to put in the rubbish or you want to cook it well? And uh, uh, look, uh, we have to be simple. Unanimity is, uh, is a red light to progress, to decision making pro process. You cannot run a condominium with unanimity. The stairs will crumble, uh, there will be no clean. Mm. Why can you run a continent? This is democracy. We cannot use democracy with rules against democracy. This is true, yeah. Thanks for your insight on this topic. Um, and then one other area in which we felt the impact of the... Um, uh, okay, sorry, I, I thought you were gone, but no, it's fine. So another area in which we felt the impact of the pandemic was the lack of certain goods due to rising barriers in global trade. Do you think the COVID pandemic and the resulting hindering of trade has shown us that we need to strengthen you, the European supply changes again? Yes. As I hinted before, mm -hmm. you have uh, clearly to go, uh, but you need a policy because there are, um, let's say, bottlenecks that are not so important, you know, you can, but there are very particular bottlenecks. Uh, uh, but uh, look, uh, uh, the most important bottlenecks are in what I called uh, uh, in my. Uh, uh, simple alphabet, uh, the internet uh, sectors, you know, from Google, Apple, uh, Alibaba, eBay, uh, Amazon, and so on and so on. And we are out of them. And uh, we cannot get, not even in the periphery of them, if you are not uh, united. The only case in which we have entered into a high-tech sector uh, dominated by non-European was uh, Airbus. Being uh, McDonald Douglas were dominating uh, Germans, French, British, and Spain united. And now number one in the world is Airbus. Same lesson. Without, you know, when, when you understand that let us not speak about America, but when when Alibaba in the Black Friday, what is called the day, they sold, if I remember, were well, thirty eight billion dollars uh, in one day, and uh, and one billion dollars in the first fourteen seconds. I repeat, fourteen seconds, one billion dollar sales. Look, we lose, we lose if we and not stick together. As Europeans. As yeah. Europeans. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, just one half year ago, half year ago, we had the CTO of Airbus, Grazia Vitadini, with us uh, as well. So that's a good connection that we, we, we try to, to um, focus on the European um, uh, yeah, innovations, so to say. 
And then when, well, the crisis, we have seen the crisis reveal some weaknesses of the EU, um, which could be tackled now. So there's an opportunity the EU, EU can um, realize. Do you think retrospectively with the crisis could be sorry, seen sorry, as- Sorry, repeat. Can so you repeat? We have, we have seen that the crisis revealed some weaknesses, but this can be seen as a chance for Europe to renew its political system. So I'm wondering if you think in the long run, in some years time, we look back and we say this was a chance for Europe to renew itself and the bonds between the member states became stronger because of the COVID crisis. Do you think we will emerge stronger? I am, I am confident also when I see the difference between a young generation and old generation. I think the real most popular event, uh, Brexit, you know, in which what, uh, there was a real split between young and men. Because, you know, all generation as we are, generally, we are more linked to the past, to our tradition. The young generation, they understand which other, you know, they know China, they know United States, uh, they have no, um, let's say, nostalgia for, for, for a, non a Europe that does not exist anymore, you know. And this made me, made me uh, really more confident because of the reality, not because I am dreaming, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jean Monnet, Jean Monnet uh, the founder of Europe, he used to say, Europe will grow through crisis. Of course, because the crisis put you in front of the unavoidable problem. True, yeah. Thank you for, for this perspective. It's optimistic view, I like it. Optimistic, less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let us now come back to the economic rebuilding part after the crisis. Um, so actually one thing that the, where the EU really demonstrated that it's still capable of realizing ambitious projects was the recent COVID recovery fund, namely Next Generation EU. I'm sure you know about it. It's a fund that will um, allow investments of 750 billion euros, which will be granted for 2021 to 23, so beginning from next year. Could you tell us what is your take on the next generation EU and will the designated investments be sufficient for a successful bounce back of the European economy? Uh, look, um, I am in favor of it, not only because I am Italian and we shall uh, uh, benefit of it, but also uh, I read, uh, I try to read uh, step by step all the 35 pages of the condition of the European Union. And uh, they are very severe, very analytic, but this is the real goal of next generation Europe, to put all the European countries uh, able to uh, to do the same, to, to run at the same speed, you know. And this is the problem for a country like Italy, because we have to change a lot of our legislation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I repeat, for uh, his severity, I like it not because of his money. And I do hope that the control will be severe as is written in the page we received because uh, the result will be Europe can run at the same speed. Any country of Europe can run at the same speed. Yeah. And all uh, for, for uh, for the problem of debt uh, uh, is a problem for a country like Italy, you know, uh, because uh, it's beyond uh, any experience uh, in a peace period. 
but uh, if there is a, a prospect of growth, uh, you can do it. In my government, uh, we I, I decreased the, the the debt income ratio in both my government. I increased sensibly because uh, I could grow, it. so it was not difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good perspective. And, and if you would compare this recovery fund to uh, Joe Biden's 1.9 trillion US dollar American rescue plan, where would you position the EU's ambitions? Uh, the direction is the same from the economic point of view. neo keynesian decision, uh, different from any expectation only one year ago. Uh, and so, if you ask me, they are similar. Mm -hmm. They are similar in terms of uh, goals. Uh, the American history is much bigger, even per capita and even per, per dollar of income uh, than the European. The American is incredible in terms of dimension, you know, but uh, the philosophy is, is uh, I repeat, a neo-Keynesian philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems like we're on a good way, on a good path. Good, I think yes, but, yeah. but, but if, I repeat, if, we make the, nest, the parallel political change that are needed. If not, will be only money wasted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I come back to that after this question, actually. So let, let me just continue with the economic rebuilding. Um, I think many of us were wondering um, if the COVID crisis is similar to the financial crisis, crisis 2008-9. Uh, could you point us, point out the similarities and also differences that the COVID crisis has um, compared to the financial crisis um, from the economic impact and also the, the perspective for rebuilding? Oh, by actually, there is no similarity. Only the word crisis is similar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, we had financial tangles. Uh, here we have uh, rain coming from the sky. Uh, their political reaction in that case was division, division, division. And I, in that case, I was blaming Germany. Uh, now I am, I am prizing Germany. <laughs> and why? Uh, different reasons, you know, because in that case, uh, there was no idea of the necessity of the collective reaction. Maybe because there was a country that was uh, cheating, you know, let us use common language, you know. Uh, uh, Greece was cheating, you know, and so there was some idea of, 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 of punishment, you know. Uh, um, let us put a parenthesis, Greece was cheating because uh, uh, many European states were forbidding when I proposed to have some sort of uh, accounting control by European Union to the budget of the different states. There was no, so they could cheat. But anyway, they were cheating. And uh, so there was the idea of a moral punishment. Now, nobody can tell that. It's, it's a terrible problem that. Uh, and so uh, it's much easier to have solidarity now than the crisis before. And the reaction was positive now. This is true, yeah. And do you think that the people, the European citizens, are similarly affected than 2008-9? Because also right now, many uh, people lost their job or th their work. Do you think this is similar to the situation we had back then? No. This is deeper. Okay. This is this is much deeper in terms of uh, spread, in terms of uh, 
uh, endurance, you know, I don't know, this is, uh, and now look, you have by definition, some sort of, of choice, you know, people in small trade, tourism, uh, restaurants, so they are devastated. Mm -hmm. uh, the crisis before you had the more, let's say, shared crisis. So there is no similarity. Right, okay. Um, so I would like now to turn to Italy's economy for one question, because speaking to you offers us a unique chance to gain profound insights about your country. So Italy's economy was hit especially hard by the COVID crisis um, when it was already in need of reformation. But now with crisis proven Mario Draghi as prime minister, and also being granted a quarter of the, the total amount of next generation EU, uh, Italy is better positioned than ever before to both overcome the pandemic, but also um, tackle some long lasting structural problems, I think. Are you optimistic that this opportunity will be made use of in Italy so that um, Italian can be, Italy can become one of the leading economic forces inside Europe. Yes, uh, look, I, I am biased because I am Italian, mm -hmm. but also I am biased because I know Mario Draghi since 1974, you know, so when you were not born and so on and so on. <laughs> but, not, not even there, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, he is a, a very high reputed, not only abroad, but also inside Italy. And the government is a, a very strong backing. Uh, different from my government, to do personal experience, uh, there is no one single party of the white coalition that is able to defeat the government. So he is strong to take decision, even if there is not a general agreement. And this is a, a very strong second. There is a, a handbook written in Brussels that is a condition to have money. And because all the members of the parliament, the government, they like to spend money, you know. Uh, if they don't spend, spend in the right direction, they don't receive money. And uh, uh, spending in the right direction is not only in the specific, uh, let's say, decision, but also in the reforms needed in order to have a higher productivity. That's in public administration, uh, public administration, uh, uh, justice, and so on. Because uh, Italian economy um, is a strange economy. You know, we are the second uh, industrial country in Europe, and we have no one big company, no one, and we are the second country. In because we have a middle range company that are fantastic efficient, you know. But if you analyze them, they are enough to have a positive trade, balance of trade. That is, uh, my colleague abroad, they don't understand how it happens, but uh, why we have, a, in spite of what I told you, we have a very low cost of labor. Our inefficiency is for external reasons uh, of, you know, but they, in general, the multinational companies operating in Italy, if you ana analyze their budget, from the Italian um, plan, they have a higher rate of profits than for <laughs> the average of their second. Because, uh, you know, the, the internal cost, you know, is the system that is not working. But the explanation is very, is very easy. The change of government, you know, it's. Uh, uh, I always tell to 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 break up the 
serious atmosphere we have today. You know, the first time I won the election, I went to Bonn to visit uh, the German Chancellor. It, it was uh, some sort of love because of common history, even if we were of different parts. You know. And uh, then uh, when he accompanied me to the to the helicopter in the Chancery Garden, he told me, oh, Robert, how nice was it, you know, uh, instead of 40 minutes, we, uh, we have been two hours uh, together, but who will come next time? You know, who will come next time? This was the question, you know, and this is, uh, we need a long term government. This is why now I do hope that uh, Draghi will bring some sort of long term life of the government. Politics is continuity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree to that. Thank you. So now I already see that there are so many questions from the audience coming in. Uh, but before addressing them, I would like to ask you something about your interesting career, because this is so unique and yeah, really inspiring for us. Um, so you left Italy's government to serve as president of the European Commission and then returned to Italy. What were the reasons for you going first to Brussels and then back to Rome? Oh, the reason is very simple, and I am writing it in a note that I am writing in this day. Well, uh, when uh, I left the government in Italy, uh, I was uh, asked because I brought Italy into the Euro, uh, I was a pro-European, uh, to be, um, let's say, president of the Commission. Many of my friends, they were trying to, 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 to look, to say, no, 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 so remain here. But no, no Italian can put a priority on domestic policy uh, concerning European policy to look. Uh, I, I want to go to Brussels because I like and because it is. Then this is a case I never told to uh, an audience. Uh, the uh, European, uh, I was center left, uh, and the European uh, government changed it. And uh, the move was to center right. And uh, so um, I was, I was uh, difficult to be reappointed. And uh, only my, uh, the center left leader was Tony Blair. But uh, we were not in agreement because of the Iraqi war. Mm. Uh, you have to understand that Iraqi war divided deeply Europe. And so, uh, but I should have liked a lot to be reappointed. I should have liked a lot to be reappointed, but it was politically impossible. And then when I went to Italy, they asked me to take the government and I won the election in Italy. But my idea was to have 10 years in Brussels. Right, okay. And did your political line center left changed over time or did you stay with it uh, for all your career? No, no, I'm, I am, um, maybe I have no imagination, but I never changed it. <laughs> now that's good, that's continuity, right? What you, what you <laughs> told us about. <laughs> <laughs> Good to I hear. changed my, my job, uh, but not my political life. <laughs> <laughs> true, yeah, true. <laughs> nice, let's finish on a personal note. One personal question to you is, um, what is it that you admire the most about the people that you surround yourself with? And also, uh, which characteristic? Oh, oh, sorry, about, about, I did it. About the I people missed. you surround yourself with, so your family, your friends. And not, not in political life? Also in political life, because I would like to ask which characteristics should bring... Well, in, in, my, in my private life, uh, my wife, uh, look, we, there is no decision that we don't take together. But hours of uh, conversation, of it, well, uh, she does not do the, my same job, but uh, she is, uh, let's say, uh, economist, but of social studies, mm -hmm. uh, let's say welfare. 
she's specialist in welfare and and so we are close you know and uh, uh, clearly uh, I repeat even even preparing this conference we, I discussed it with her what mm -hmm. to say <laughs> <laughs> that's good teamwork politically and... mm -hmm. you you may think that is a strange uh, a strange position you know because um, uh, apart from the French admiration of uh, let's say previous your chancellor you know the political in my life who has a strange mixture uh, unique uh, is bill clinton strange because not only a highly intelligent you know but also able to uh, let's say to aggregate the consent uh, in a strange way but uh, when we had the G8, and the first day you have uh, all your dossier, your paper, and so on. but then you discuss uh, freely. He was he has a, he had a unique ability in uh, let's say putting uh, people together, and uh, politics is uh, to put people together, you know. So uh, I have this, but of course I have uh, many, many uh, European politicians uh, who are such high class when I think, let's say, in my life, how it was productive to work with Chirac, with uh, Chancellor Merkel, with uh, uh, Kohl. Uh, it was like, uh, uh, some sort also of friendship, you know, understanding. Uh, this is why Europe uh, can be done. This is why Europe can be done. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Thank you for this personal insight. Thank you. So now we come to the Q&A session. So I will read the questions from the audience, the most popular ones. Um, the first one um, is, what relevant positive business aspects will Corona bring in the long term, apart from the broader possibility of working from home? Uh, my no, I understand business in Europe, European business. Or? I think in general, positive business aspects. Uh, um, you mean the new occasion of business for Europe? You mean? So, so basically how, I, I think it is meant how, um, how we can renew our businesses. So what, which positive oh, impacts there might be no. through the COVID crisis? Uh, look, uh, we need, uh, we need uh, uh, a jump in, uh, in cooperation. We need uh, uh, new dimensions, you know, to, in terms of, uh, innovate business you know uh, uh, the, the, let's say uh, the dimension of uh, of the uh, new leaders in the world are uh, are incredible high if we don't uh, have the same size look you were you were hinting about uh, next generation EU six hundred billion euros and so on but if when i analyze the increase in the stock exchange value of a single company in the years of pandemia were 400 billion dollars <laughs> to <laughs> fight among giants need giants yes yeah Good point. Okay. Um, and then Benedict was asking, what did convince you to strive for a career in academia in the first place? And what made you switch into politics? Life. <laughs> no, look, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I, when I was a young, uh, Student, I, uh, my idea was economics, economics, and economics. So 
my idea was academia, also because I am eight brother, eight of nine brothers, six of them academic, you know. So it was like going to to to, to, to the rest, <laughs> and so uh, and. Um, and then I, I liked it, and it was a good career. But uh, then I uh, was interested in political life, and I have to tell you frankly, when Berlusconi went to power, uh, there was uh, in Italy a spread of all the political uh, reformers group and so on and so on, and fighting each other uh, in one moment, uh, a group of people said, uh, "Prodi, try," and of course, I tried. Mm, I tried, you know, and uh, my idea was uh, very simple. Before the Berlin Wall, uh, Italy was divided in two parts: anti-communist and communists, because of the history. When uh, this ended, it was necessary to remake Italian policy and put together reformists and uh, conservatives, payer dignity and so on and so on. When the group of conservatives went in the end of Berlusconi, uh, look, there was some sort of uh, regrouping and uh, in that moment, uh, I was uh, asked to, 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 to take the lead, and I tried uh, touring from one year so with an old bus in Italy to be known uh, without money. And I won only because uh, uh, Berlusconi's reaction was late. It was too late because he was he was not taking me seriously, you know, because this stupid professor was just doing it. But it was too late. <laughs> so this is why speed is so important in politics. <laughs> Good example. Uh, I remember that. <laughs> nice, thank you. And then uh, Francesco was asking, dear president, what do you think is going to be the role of the younger EU generations in the post-COVID EU? Uh, we, I don't know which will be, but we need them. We need, we need the Erasmus generation because they are bored uh, with less, uh, breaks in their mind, you know, simply like that. They, uh, they understand dimension things, which is the world of today. They have no, no nostalgia of, uh, of uh, the past, you know. Uh, they should never have voted Brexit. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, now we, we have a lot of young leaders everywhere, you know, so I am not pessimist for that. What it makes me a little uh, worried is that uh, the traditional parties, they had a lot of uh, weaknesses, but uh, in some way with them continuity and long-term vision was more possible because you had traditional organization and so on. And uh, when you have this new uh, let's say groups, uh, you have less rules and democracy is made by severe rules. Procedure is important as substance, you know. And so it's difficult to, to, to have innovation and uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you think the best way for a young leader would be to start in a um, traditional party in its home country? Yes. And say, or renew, in order to renew it, you know, mm -hmm. or to found those a new party, but with uh, severe real rules. Uh, I repeat, if you have no severe rule, democracy is in danger, you know especially with the new media, 
the new media are fantastic to, 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 to create to create some sort of uh, of event and so on and so on. And so uh, uh, the danger for democracy is emotion. Emotion is important, but uh, must be regulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. And then we have another question from Professor Friede himself. Um, he was asking President Prodi, you mentioned the concerns about inflation. Do you think that the European Central Bank should challenge its should change, sorry, its policy towards a more conservative monetary policy? What alternative options do we have? No, <laughs> I told you before, I am not a central banker. I have this concept of real economy, so I cannot say what's it. Uh, I, in today's economy, I think that uh, 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 European Central Bank, by nature, uh, has interest to follow the American uh, policy. You know, you cannot have a, a, say, a contrasting policy. And uh, so the analysis is that uh, today increasing prices is only temporary. And so um, uh, if uh, the analysis is correct, uh, the decision-making process is correct. Uh, I'm really a, a little frustrated by uh, this uh, um, rate of growth, quantity of money on the table, and increase of raw materials and uh, and product. And then um, I'm think another aspect. Uh, there will be a, ch a minor change in competition, as as I told before. A minor change in competition means that in some way there will be increase of price, you know, because uh, the normal increase of Chinese imports, uh, they had a consequence, negative consequence on, on labor, but a, a positive consequence for consumers. If you in some way change, if not substantially, but if in some way you change, you have uh, also from this point of view, uh, a small increase in prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Thank you. And, and then there's another question from Robert, who is asking, what are Italy's priorities inside the EU? Uh, I tell you, uh, as a national... Look, uh, when I was president of the Commission, uh, the priority was East for everybody. You know, uh, this has been very positive for Germany that has created a fantastic uh, economic area around the country. And then uh, the problem started to, to come from the south. And uh, now we have uh, trouble in the Mediterranean, immigrants. Uh, uh, an increase in split between south and north. And so the Italian priority is now, in my opinion, also the European priority, Mediterranean. But we have to have bold decisions. We have, look, uh, the European foreign policy must be European. So, uh, uh, I was proposing when I was president of the Commission to have mixed universities in the Mediterranean, you know, to say university in Barcelona and in Rabat together, uh, Naples and Tunisia and so on, and to have some same number of students from south and north, same number of professors south and north, two years studying south, two years studying north, no theology, no political science, only let's say economics, medicine, so on, so on, to create 
to create the community. And, but, you know, there was no solidarity. They say, no, is money wasted. And second, uh, it was a situation, it was a situation in which, sorry, Uh, now you're back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It, <laughs> was, it was a situation in which uh, there was the idea of having around Europe some sort of peace, you know. So the idea was look, look we have to stop the enlargement. I do think that we have to enlarge Europe to the Balkans, then stop. And the old dream there was Turkey, but now the game is over, but to create around Europe a ring of friends in which each country from Belarusia to Syria to Israel to Libya till Morocco, you can create a special agreement one by one with the European Union in order to have a new framework, you know. This is what is needed for, for Italy as a priority in the sense that uh, our Mezzogiorno, our country, if in front of us we have nothing, we cannot have anything. Uh, our, uh, we are Mediterranean, you know, it's, uh, uh, and this is uh, my dream, but is also for peace, for peace, uh, think to Lebanon, think, you know, how Lebanon was linked to Europe, how Syria was linked to Europe. We have to go back to these relations, you know, a new policy for Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. I agree, yeah, especially with the bonds between member states of the EU. I think that's the first step in the right direction. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so another question was respected President Prodi, what kind of political social goals does the European Union want to achieve? Uh, the social goals you, you told social goals? Yeah, exactly. Uh, look uh, uh, there are we studied uh, with the commission that was uh, three years ago. Uh, on uh, social Europe. And uh, of course, social policy must be national policy, you know, because uh, uh, what can be decided at national level must be decided at national level. Mm -hmm. But as we have seen in the pandemic, we must have a, a European framework for the big resources from some sort of uh, uh, a common, uh, uh, let's say, general rules. And uh, in this commission, we have found three fields in which social, European social policy will have a priority. Health, education, and uh, uh, affordable housing. This new terminology, in my time, it was called social housing, but now <laughs> it's called affordable housing. And, uh, and these are the three fields in which uh, we need uh, to, uh, well, let's say, to have uh, a great push of resources coordinated in order to, um, let's say, to have some sort of equal or let's say not equal but anyway converging social situation in Europe you know and uh, what I found very strange is that uh, uh, the highest need I, I thought that the highest need was education and uh, health and the result is that highest need is health because of old age of uh, let's say aging of people Second, housing. There is a terrible need of housing for split of families, you know, mobility and so on. And then uh, 
investment in education where already we have some, you know, but these are, answering to the question, these are the three main fields in which we must have a national policy, but a political environment in which, uh, and uh, let's say, um, uh, source of resources in which to organize a general political framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So then one last question, I think, because then we we'll unfortunately run out of time. Uh, so the last question from Christian is on climate change. And he's asking, how can the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement still be achieved? Mustn't climate change have an even higher priority in EU actions? Look, uh, this is an argument I like most, you know, because it was my commission that uh, did, uh, with the Swedish commissioner lady, we did a lot of job to approve uh, the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol was the first international uh, world agreement on climate. And it was approved against the United States and China. And so I was begging around the world. And the last day of my commission, uh, I had uh, the number of countries enough to approve the protocol. But then mm, the decision taken were not implemented at all. Then we had another agreement and the big Paris agreement. But when I look, at the result are not good uh, because the implementation is uh, now, but we had a very favorable change. US and, and China after being out and in, now they are not only strongly in, but strongly approving the agreement. But, uh, so I agree with the very ambitious European goals. But I am also a realistic economist, and I say we are we have only seven percent of uh, waste uh, uh, in the world of uh, let's say um, uh, polluting the world, you know. And if we have not a general agreement, and to let's say to have a clean a clean strategy, we need money, and you have to spend money and our cost will increase and must increase for that. I don't want that we found ourselves in a situation in which then we shall have people revolting them because we shall lose workers or wills. Give a concrete example. Take solar energy. Fantastic decision, great progress, but only one producer, China. And a lot of in one field, you can, let's say, say, look, uh, we have a great goal, even if we lose some job. But when we afford a general strategy for a clean planet, uh, we need uh, a planetarian effort. Otherwise, if we have only an effort from 7% of polluters, will not be successful. And so uh, internal European effort, but an external uh, policy. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great message to take home. So we end with this question and thank you for the, all the good questions. So thanks to the audience, that was really a good discussion. And with that, um, I want to thank you, President Prodi, and hand over to Friede for some closing words after I will close the session. Look, I have been only happy and I am at your disposal because since uh, already 13 years, I am only a professor, a former professor, but a professor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. And professor is the best job that you can have, uh, right? So that yes, is I like it. I like it. <laughs>
Okay, uh, uh, President Prodi, it was wonderful listening to you. Uh, you have such a um, balanced, optimistic, and simultaneously realistic view on uh, basically our uh, on, on, the, on our continent, on Europe, and uh, on our future. So uh, it was really a pleasure to uh, to, to have you here. Uh, I'm very grateful that you shared your insights with us. That you uh, that you spent so many so much time with our students, and that you were so openly answering all of their questions. So that was really a pleasure, and uh, I cannot uh, do more than just say thank you very much uh, um, for, for 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 being with us. Thanks, President. No, thank you. Really, it was my pleasure. I am grateful for your invitation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All the best for you. And, so, thank, you. and thank you very thank much you. from the Tom Speaker Series team. It was a great event. Pleasure to have you. Uh, so just a quick reminder to our audience, please let us know how you liked the event by filling out the survey we post in the chat. And please follow us on the social media platforms for future events. Stay so keen. I, am, is I, am un, I, I understand I am under examination. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Clara. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Prodi. Bye-bye. <laughs>